Would you open your Bibles? We're going to John chapter 21. This is a, a, a short passage for me. And, um, but I, as I looked at it, I thought, we, I cannot pass this over. This is very powerful. It looks like a simple event, but it, it reveals an enormous amount about the heart of our Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus, we love you. We believe in you. You are with us. You said you were. You're here right now. We ask you to open our hearts. We would bring you soft hearts. We need you to teach us. We need to, our eyes to see you spiritually and our ears to hear. I ask for the grace, Lord, to let that happen, to let your word open up, to let us watch you serve breakfast to seven hungry men, to understand that you serve us the same way. You're amazing. Come and reveal your heart to us. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. All right. We are in John chapter 21. John is giving us an event that the other gospels did not. John was the last gospel written. He knew what the others wrote. He knew what, what Mark wrote at Peter's leading. John Mark wrote what Peter told him to write. He knew what Luke wrote. He knew what Matthew wrote. And he knew none of them had told this story. None of them had told about this time at the Sea of Galilee while they were waiting in Galilee for the Lord to appear. And he said, they have to hear this. People have to hear this. And so we just heard about how Jesus showed up on the shore and suddenly they had this huge catch of 153 fish, large fish. And we said that the fish that, that, that are there in the lake of uh, Sea of Galilee are tilapia, the large ones, and sardines are the little ones. And so when it says they're large ones, they had tilapia. How many like tilapia? Yeah, yeah that's very good with, never mind. <laughs> With them. My wife cooks it with a little bit of oil, and tilapia is lovely. So they got 153 tilapia, is what they had. And uh, he, he's, he's showing them that he will provide for them, and that's what we saw last week. I will provide for you. He had multiplied the fish uh, when he first called them. He was asking them to leave their livelihoods. He was asking them to in a sense, leave their families. Uh, they would visit at times, but they were going out and traveling with him. So he says, I will provide for you. I will not forsake you. And we said last week that if you and I do not understand God as our provider, we will never be able to step forward in ministry. Every form of ministry has some sort of financial component to it, you might say, that if I'm going to do this, it'll cost me something. If I, if I give up that to go serve the Lord or do this or go on a mission or, or give to a missionary or stay home and, and, uh, and, and care for my kids because the Lord's asking me to and not work, there's always a financial component. And I'm going to have to walk in faith and believe that God will be my provider. Does that make sense? Yeah, we saw that powerful lesson last week. When those fish came in, I think he, he, Peter went to the boat and he, he, he pulled that big net in. We said it, the, the, it's a trammel net, apparently. Uh, I didn't know what one was until I studied it last week. So I, I, maybe you did, but it's, it's, it's three layers. It's two big outer layers and then it's got, a, I think, a gill net in the middle. And the fish swim into it and get stuck, as far as I can tell. And there's about 100 feet of this thing. And so Peter pulls this in and I think he takes out about... Uh, seven or eight of these tilapia and he brings them to Jesus and Jesus serves them breakfast now you can go right on by this and just go well yeah he served them breakfast let's go on to the next thing which is is where he takes Peter and and reconciles with him after each one of the denials it's a <laughs> tremendous passage that's coming up but stop and think about it the resurrected messiah the divine son of God actually cooked breakfast. Now, if, 
if it were you or me, we'd have pointed at it and gone, you, you f- fixed breakfast. W- w- he fixed breakfast. He cooked it. it. I mean, and then he served it. It says this. He served them breakfast. He handed them the bread. He handed each one the fish. I looked at that and I thought, wow. Look who we're talking about. Jesus served them. Now that's character, people. We're seeing his heart. We're seeing who he is. Wouldn't you think that the glorious resurrected one, we sang about him, I sang about him just now. You who, you who created this, you named the stars, you walked beneath them, didn't we sing something like that? You, and isn't he the word? Yep. And now he's in his resurrected glory. I mean, he, you know, the, the suffering and the, oh, that's past. He's in his resurrected glory. And he shows up on the beach, makes a campfire, Let's it burn down to charcoal, to coals, and then cook some breakfast and serves them like a waiter in a restaurant. This is our Lord. Amen. He's humble. He's kind. He's amazing. Let's have a look. I'm going to pick up there at verse 9. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish pla- a, a fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. And I would su- suppose that, as I said, I, it's probably about seven of the fish. There's seven men. Um, with Jesus, there's eight. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now, says John, the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's look at our study. He will come. When, when we say yes to Jesus, he enlists us into his mission of saving, healing, and loving people. And that can be hard, dangerous, tiring work. Have you discovered that yet? I had a talk the other day with one of our young leaders and he said, wow, he said, when, when you used to talk about feeling so discouraged and all, he said, I didn't really understand it. And he said, now that I minister, <laughs> I do understand it. And it was a beautiful moment. I, I, said, I said to him, I said, and would you, will you suffer like that for Jesus the rest of your life? Will you be willing to? Did you hear what I'm asking him? I mean, aren't you supposed to tell everybody that this is just nothing but happiness? That if you follow this Lord, I mean, let him be your co-pilot and you know your your business partner and stuff, and you get rich and happy. And he, he does provide for us. We saw that last week. He does. He he is with us. He loves us. But have you noticed that serving is hard work? Have you noticed that there's a, a spiritual component to it, and there's an enemy who doesn't like what you do? Have you found that? Because if you if you've ministered, you have. If you've stepped out, you've realized the, the cost to this thing, the pressure to this thing. And then you ask yourself, wow, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Because I, I do think that's how he gets us. <laughs> and then we go through the question, will I continue? Will I serve him the rest of my life? Will I live for him? Will I take up my cross and follow him? And, and that, that question comes along. So... Every, any person, any man or woman who steps out is going to find out that this is, there's a tiring element, a hard element, a, 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 even a dangerous element. It can wear us out. But as we watch Jesus serve breakfast to a group of hungry disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, we learn something very important about our Lord. 
He is not indifferent to our sufferings. He is not passive or thankless. He knows when we grow hungry, weary, lonely, or afraid, and he will come to comfort us. He will show us his love in surprising acts of kindness, and that kindness is very practical. It meets us at our point of need. He feeds us when we're hungry. He sits with us when we are lonely. He builds our faith when we are fearful. He restores our vision when we are discouraged. And those surprising acts of kindness remind us of who he is and assure us of his respect for us. Did you see how I phrased that? I, almost, I, I, I wasn't sure I could write that. His respect for us. If, as you walk with this Jesus, you will find he, you, you are not some little servant of his. He, he loves you and he loves what you do. And he respects it. Amen. He treats you as a valued partner, you might say. It surprises me. I mean, I, I really love the worship tonight. Just the whole thing with the, the, just the depth of God's love to us. The longer I walk with him. Oh, George is reminding me there is large print. And, and I thought this was pretty big print tonight. But you, if you want large print, just hold your hand up and, and you'll get one. So you can see that's not a, a great cloud on the page. He, he shows us res, respect. His, he will... Uh, it meets us at our point of need. He feeds us when we're hungry. He sits with us when we are lonely. He builds our faith when we are fearful. He restores our vision when we are discouraged. And those surprising acts of kindness remind us of who he is and assure us of his respect for us. We are his people, his beloved, his bride. Why don't you say that? We are his people, his beloved, his bride. He is deeply aware of our suffering. And we can count on him to come and help us in our time of need. That's one of the lessons we learned from that amazing breakfast in Galilee. Those seven men weren't foolish when they went fishing. A lot of, a lot of people who, who look at that passage will say, they shouldn't have been fishing. They'd been called to the ministry. Well, look at these guys going back to fishing and they scold them. They needed to provide for their families. You know that they were, Peter, we know Peter was married. In fact, it was his mother-in-law's house. Uh, he, Jesus heals his mother-in-law. Remember that? To get a mother-in-law, you got a wife. Yep. <laughs> See? And you learn stuff as life goes on. They, they needed to provide for their families, but after a long, cold night on the lake, they had caught nothing. And they must have been discouraged that morning. Each one of those men had left his livelihood to follow Jesus. But that season of traveling with him from town to town was now, now over. All they knew was that at that moment that he was, pardon me, all they knew at that moment was that he was alive and that he had told them to wait for him in Galilee. So they were waiting. But waiting didn't feed their families. That's why Peter said, I'm going fishing and allowed the others to join him. He was willing to share whatever they caught. But as the first light of morning turned the dark sky gray, they were all sitting there in that boat with nothing to show for their efforts. They must have been tired, cold, and hungry when suddenly one of them spotted a man standing on the shore about 100 yards away. It was Jesus. The glorious, resurrected Messiah and divine Son of God had come down to the beach and lit a campfire and was going to serve them breakfast. Those of you going to Israel, when you go up and you're in the Sea of Galilee, you'll go out in a boat, you'll be very close to where this took place. My guess is it's somewhere around Capernaum. There's some hot springs there. And so the boats can come up near the shore. They, they catch a lot of tilapia. I, I mentioned in one of the services, I don't think it was this one last week. I just read, what did they read? Uh, in 1968... They caught 302 tons of tilapia in that, in that lake. So commercial fishing, I mean, this is not a joke. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's real stuff. And, and they can go right off the shore. And that north shore right in that area is heavy basalt rock. So it's not just a, there's, there's sandy beaches stuck in among it. 
Uh, but in that part of the thing, there's a lot of basalt rock and all. And um, they're not far, about 100 yards offshore, probably working around that area where the warm water is, uh, trying to get the fish. And he's standing 100 yards there on the shore. We must not skip over these few verses. The event they describe is absolutely amazing. It beautifully reveals the heart of our Lord. It shows us how he cares for us. It teaches us how to care for others. Let's join those seven men at that campfire and learn with them the same lessons. Would you turn that over to your Bible study? I'm only doing a few days today. Monday. Let's go back and look at the story. When they reached land, they saw a campfire which had already been, had burned down to hot coals with fish cooking on it and bread waiting nearby. And then Jesus spoke to them and said, now bring some of the fish which you caught. The one roasting on the fire would not be enough for all of them. Peter went back to the boat and drew the net closer to land. John tells us the fish were large, which means they were tilapia. So Peter probably only took seven or eight to Jesus. John also wants to under, us to understand the magnitude of this miracle. When the fish were counted, there were 153, enough so each of those men could take them home to their family. And there was one more aspect of the miracle that John mentions. Even with all the weight and pressure of so many fish being towed ashore, the net was not torn. Not one fish was lost. When the fish were cooked, Jesus said, come eat breakfast. In the fact that he needed to invite the disciples to move closer indicates that they were standing at a distance, staring at him while he prepared the food. So that was awkward. Uh, he's, he's there cooking, and they're all standing back gaping like that. It was an odd thing. Then John adds a surprising observation. He says, not one of the disciples had the courage to question him about his identity by asking, who are you? Recognizing that it was the Lord. There, there may have been something different about him that caused them to want to ask that question. I think whatever the difference was, there was in his appearance, if indeed there was a difference was due to the fact that they were seeing the resurrected Jesus, not a resuscitated Jesus. Jesus' crucified body had not simply come back to life. It had been transformed into its new immortal condition. Did you understand what I just said? This was not Jesus just alive again. This is Jesus resurrected, like you're going to be. The miracle had happened. His flesh is different. It's real. It's solid. It's actually more solid, more real than what, than, than, than what we have now. But it's different. It's, Im, it's immortal flesh. There, there's, there's something. So they, they know it's him. But he looks different. How many are hoping you will too? You know? <laughs> yes. I can't tell you how I'm trusting this. Yeah. Wednesday. Paul explains so beautifully, as he does, a resurrected body differs, differs substantially from an earthly body. He says the new body is more glorious, it is imperishable, it has no weakness, and it is spiritual, meaning it completely cooperates with our spirit and has none of the impulses and temptations of our old mortal bodies. That it deserves a hallelujah. Aren't you tired of dragging this donkey behind you? With all of its emotions and this, don't, do, do, do crazy things come out of you too? I mean, you think, where did that come from? This, 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 this thing we're living in. Paul says it. He says this stuff is lodged in our flesh. And he says, so I, here I am wanting to obey the Lord. And here's my body doing all this dumb stuff. He said, woe is me, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this dying mortal body? It will, you and I will be delivered. But not till the resurrection. I mean, we'll, when, if we die, the thing falls off and our, we have a spiritual body. But at the resurrection, the body you will get will have no more of these passions in that sense. You'll have joyful passions. You'll have all of the lovely things, the clean things, the good things. But you'll not have the ugly things. There'll be no more. You won't be wrestling with this. You won't be fighting back thoughts. You won't, you won't have all that garbage going on. That's heaven in itself as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. No more depression. 
That, that, I mean, that's worth a sermon right there. I mean, we can just go, go home right there. Just get that garbage off of us. So that, Paul, he says it has, even it, it even has another form of flesh. He says that. So the person who's, who, the person those men met on the beach that morning was the same Jesus they had known so well. Yet there was also something wonderfully different about him. And it was that difference that made them want to ask questions. But as John says, no one had the courage to do it, not even Peter. You know they're scared when Peter doesn't say anything. We even need to ask ourselves if we hope to look, pardon me, we need only to ask ourselves if we hope to look exactly like we do now after we're resurrected, or do we hope that our appearance will be somewhat different to appreciate the significance of the change in Jesus' appearance? I think we all expect our resurrected bodies to look healthier and better than our mortal bodies, and that was true of Jesus as well. One more. In this verse, John describes an event that is so practical, it would be easy to overlook its meaning. He tells us, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish in the same way. In other words, Jesus personally served the food to his disciples. He stepped forward and picked up the bread and handed a piece to each man and then took the roasted fish and did the same, probably handing a whole roasted fish to each one. What makes that simple act so remarkable is who is serving whom. The resurrected Messiah, the divine son of God, was waiting on those seven men like a servant waits on a table of guests. He lit the fire, cooked the food, and then personally served each one. Undoubtedly, they were all tired and hungry after a night of fishing. But one would hardly expect the resurrected Jesus to make them breakfast. John mentions this because it reveals so much about Jesus' character and the way he cares for us. Even in his glorious state, he is still the greatest servant of all. Would you turn back? The greatest servant. We humans have, ha have a hard time un understanding God because he is so different from us. And nothing is more different than the way he defines greatness. It is virtually upside down from the way humans normally think about greatness. Listen, and would you read this with me? Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Why don't we do the next, the next statement? This is a, three chapters later in, in Matthew. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. See, this is, the, the, I think, the reason that we get so n twisted up in our theology is God is so profoundly different from us. Uh, we have a hard time, for example, with the idea of the Trinity, with the idea of a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, because in our minds, if you have three, they're all going to be squabbling. <laughs> and if you put three humans in any, in any th situation, we're going to be fighting for who's leading and who gets the credit and we've, all of this kind of stuff. And yet in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the relationship of the Father and the Son, the Son con continually submits gladly to his father. The father turns around and commands all creation to submit to his son. There is no ego. How can that be? Look at the size of this universe. <laughs> Look at the power that's in this thing. And he spoke it. Woo. I mean, that's just beyond comprehension. He just spoke it. And boom, you've got a universe. Woo. And he's humble. Humble? He would f wash their feet at a Passover meal and serve them breakfast when they're hungry and cold? He would do what? You see how different he is? It, it's really staggering how different he is. That he would be kind, that he would be humble, that, he was, that he's not pompous 
And, and don't we portray him as pompous? I mean, we, we, we build these enormous buildings because God is great. You know, we, we do all this God stuff. You know, he's like, he's up there going. Brr. That's not God. That's the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> do not look at the man behind the curtains. You know. And in, in, in if we were to concoct God, that's about what we'll come up with. The Wizard of Oz. But when you look at the real one, he's just stunning. And, and it, we can hardly believe our eyes. The point Jesus is making in these statements is that God gives authority to those who will rise, or who will use that authority to care for his people. Not to those who will exploit or abuse them. I'll do it again. He gives authority to those who will use that authority to care for his people. Not to those who will exploit or abuse them. He doesn't trust people who are full of personal ambition. He looks for those who are motivated by a love for others. And in very practical ways have chosen to use their time, energy, and resources. To be kind to those in need. In God's economy, it is, it is the servant who is great and those who are selfish who are least. Jesus is the greatest example of this. He left heaven and became a man so he could serve us. He put our needs ahead of his own and there was no limit to the depth of his servant heart. He was willing to give his life as a ransom for us. And that, Paul says, listen to this, is why the Father made him the head over all creation. Listen to this. For this reason. Say, for this reason. For this reason. Say it again. For this reason. For this reason. For this reason. You've got to get a hold of this. Jesus is the, the head of all. It is at his, his name that every knee shall bow. Not, just, not because he's the Son of God. Because... He's the greatest servant of all. Listen, listen, Paul says this. I'm not, it's not my idea. For this reason, God highly exalted him. And, and if you've just, what the, the, what's just gone before that is Paul, Paul says, he counted it not robbery to be equal to, with God. And he, he took and he laid aside, divested of himself of his privileges of identity, uh, of divinity, and became a man. And not only a man, but he, to the, he, he, um, he embraced death, to the point of the cross. The, the, the prince of heaven. Left all of that. Became a man. And died on the worst thing that the Romans could invent. To torture someone slowly and miserably to death. He did that for us. And then Paul says have this mind in yourselves. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Think like him. Think like him. He did all of this. And then, and then he says what I just read. For this reason. God has therefore highly exalted him. And given him. Bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at his name. Uh, pardon me. The name of Jesus. Every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven. That would be what? The saints that have gone before. The angels. Uh, those that are in, on earth. And those that are under the earth. And I'm not sure who those are. Unless it's those who have died apart from God. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His Lordship, says Paul, is a reward for his servanthood. The servant of all has become the Lord of all. Kindness. Kindness is an action, not an attitude. Empathy is an attitude, not an action. Empathy is the emotions we feel when someone is hurting. You and I can look at a situation and go, oh, I'm sorry. That's miserable. And do nothing. That's empathy. I'm emoting. I am feeling with you the pain you're feeling. It's a good thing. But it, empathy is very different than kindness. A person can feel empathy but do nothing to help. Kindness is different. It is expressed only when someone sees a need and does something about it. 
The need may be large or small. But when a person stops what they are doing and meets that, meets that need, kindness has taken place. Jesus taught us this principle in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Basically, in that parable, he says, loving one's neighbor means to be kind to them. You recall the parable? Uh, this parable is just, this, this is one of those parables that just works on me. Does it you? Uh, over the years. It's one of those parables that just keeps having its work inside of me. Just our whole missions program, everything we do. You, you've got the picture of a man who's, who's, who's going down a road. He's been beaten then by, by uh, bandits. Uh, they throw him, strip, strip him, take everything from him, throw his body by the side of the road, nearly naked. And then people start coming by. And it's, first of all, it's two religious people who come by. But they can't touch him or, because they're afraid they will get ceremonially unclean. So, so Jesus is going at, this, this, going at this idea that the law prevents me from being kind. Remember their struggle with Jesus was constantly over that he healed on what day? Which means the law should have prevented him from being kind to a man with a withered hand or, or a woman who's bent double. He should have ignored that and the law should not have let him heal in their minds. That was the issue. So here we have... You've got a Levite that goes by first, and you've got a priest that goes by. No one will touch this man. And then comes a Samaritan. He's not even a Jew. You know, he, this, there's got racial prejudice in there. You've got, you've got religious prejudice in there. Everything. Here comes, the, here comes the Samaritan. And he stops. And what does he do? He doesn't go, oh, oh, boy, I bet that hurts. Woo. <laughs> you poor guy. That would be empathy. What did he do? He took him and he, he poured, what is he, I, I think wine, which is going to what? Sterilize it, right? The alcohol into the wounds and oil. And then he takes the man and puts him on his donkey or beast, whatever it is. And then he takes him to an inn nearby and says to the guy, here is, Here's quite a bit of money. Oh, keep him for the, the, until, and then anything else he needs, you just keep him till he's well, and I'll, on my way back through, I'll pay you the difference, whatever it takes. Did you notice that? That's kindness. Empathy is, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Kindness puts oil and wine in his wounds, puts him on the beast, pays money, takes him. Kindness acts. That's what he's saying. And he says, our idea, what he wants from us of loving our neighbor is that we would be kind. Yes. Not empathize, kindness. John wanted us, wanted to tell us about Jesus serving his disciples breakfast. So we will understand that our Lord is kind, not only in the fact that he came to die for us on the cross, but in the personal things we suffer as his disciples. No matter, no matter is too small. He'll even feed us when we're hungry. Elijah and the angel. You probably remember this. I love this story. Elijah received God's kindness when he fled for his life into the wilderness south of Beersheba. You'll be, so you're the, the Israel trip, you'll be in Beersheba uh, in a couple of days. After 400 Baal prophets had been destroyed at Mount Carmel, Jezebel, the Baal-worshipping wife of Israel's king, had vowed to kill him. And, had, and filled with fear, he traveled over 100 miles before collapsing under a broom tree. Now, your Bible may say a juniper tree, but I, I looked it up. It is not a, broom, a juniper tree. It is a rotom. And there's no question what a rotom is. It's... It, you, it is a broom tree, and you have some idea of a broom bush, I would call it. You know, what a, you know what a rotom is. It's what we have, we call it scotch broom. Nice reaction. I agree with you 110%. Do you know that we brought that in? Yeah, 
they, they, Washington State saw California had all these oleanders down the middle of their freeways. And he's like, that's a great idea, you know. It's a barrier for lights and safety and everything. So they said, what are we going to grow up here in Washington? Because we can't grow oleanders. And so somebody said, let's use scotch broom. And so they brought it in and planted it down the center of our freeways. Well, that stuff so reproduces. It's got pollen. It's got seeds. It's got roots. It, and you can't dynamite it out. I'll get off that. <laughs> it grows in Israel, but it doesn't look quite as green. It's a different species of it. But these things grow out in the hot deserts. You can get out there and these rotom bushes, and they get quite high or quite, quite big. And it says that here, here's, here's Elijah, and he has just gone through the business with the Baal prophets. 400 prophets are killed. And Jezebel, she's a Phoenician princess, Jezebel, who's... Uh, Hears of this, and she, she sends a messenger to him and says, so be it to me if by tomorrow you're not dead. She sent an assassin's man, she's, and she means every word of it. He's a, he's a dead man walking. And so he's, he takes and leaves that, that, that area of the Jezreel Valley. He goes 90, 90 miles down to, to, uh, to Beersheba, and then he goes a day's journey out into the wilderness. day's journey is about 20 miles. And then he falls down exhausted under a rotom, this, this big old bush sitting there, and, and, and he, he falls down into the shade of it. The great, the great prophet was tired, hungry, thirsty, and discouraged. He felt so low, he actually asked God to let him die. He was convinced that he was a failure. And then this happened. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, a rotom, a broom bush. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, arise, eat. And then he looked and behold, and there was at his hand, head, a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord, would you say angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord is not just any old angel. That phrase is, is I believe, the pre-incarnate Jesus. He's a very special person. I mean, this is, he's not, this is not just one of the angels. This isn't Gabriel. It isn't Michael. This is the angel of the Lord. He came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and nights to Horeb, the mountain of God, which is Mount Sinai, which is down in Saudi Arabia, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and so he, he, he walked. Notice how he treated him. I believe the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate son of God, Jesus. And please notice how he treated Elijah in that moment of weakness. He didn't scold him. He didn't shame him for being afraid. He didn't demand that he turn around and go back. At least not yet. That weary man needed more, much more healing before he would be ready for another confrontation. No, the Lord was gentle with him. He cared for his practical needs. He cooked a meal and gave him a drink of water. And watched over him while he slept twice. And that same Lord took care of those seven weary disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And takes care of us when we need him. Amen. This is who he is. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't scold Elijah. I just love that. <laughs> This is the great prophet Elijah. He has just called down fire from heaven. And it has burnt up a stone, a stone altar. <laughs> I mean, can you do that? Can I do that? I mean, this, this guy's got the goods. He will go up to heaven in a, in a chariot. And he's scared spitless. And he's weary and he's depressed. And he literally says, oh, God, let me die. I love that. He so encourages me. 
And then here comes the angel of the Lord. And he just pats him and says, you need to eat something. And has bread baking. Notice his M.O. He's a good cook. <laughs> what can I say? He's, he, he's baking him bread. And he's got a jar of water. And he feeds him. And then lets him. Then he's so tired. He just out he goes again. You see the exhaustion? He's, he's exhausted. And he, he sits there and watches over him while he sleeps. And then he wakes him up again. And says come on eat, eat more. You got a long way to go. And he gives him more bread and more water and refreshes him. And Elijah went for 40 days and nights in the strength of that. Down to what is, what is the mountain's still there. Sinai is still there. And, I mean, of course it is. Um, and he goes into a cave, and there is a cave indeed in it. And, he's, he, and the Lord is talking to him. You remember the thing about the wind and, the, and all of those? And the Lord was not in the wind and he was not in the fire. But he was in the still, small voice. Elijah, what are you doing here? Oh, it says a month and a half later. And then he, then he says, now I, I want you to go back. And he sends him back on the road that goes around outside of everything. It, it, in fact, if you are where I say, I, Mount Sinai, I think it's, the, there is a, the road goes north, and, and it's the way of the wilderness that goes up, out, uh, right there when you go to, when you are at uh, Elat, it's, it's right through those hills, and then it goes out into the wilderness. He'll go that way to Damascus and appoint the next king. But not till he was healed. Not till he was cared for by this tender Lord. If you and I, finding comfort, if you and I are going to make it through the pressures of being a disciple of Jesus, we must learn to find his comfort. Ministry drains us. After, pour, uh, after a pouring out, there must be a filling up. After a giving, there must be a receiving. And Jesus knows that. He doesn't expect us to never grow tired or become spiritually hungry. In fact, he expects just the opposite. He is sure we will grow tired and become spiritually hungry. And we've learned today that he is committed to care for us when that happens. But how does he do it? He didn't show up every morning to serve those disciples breakfast. Just that one morning. Wouldn't that be something? But by visibly caring for them in that one moment of need, he was teaching them what he would do invisibly for them in every moment of need. Uh, uh, did you follow? Yeah. By visibly caring for them in that one moment of need, he was teaching them what he would do invisibly for them in every moment of need. He was assuring them that he would always be there because that's who he is. He is kind. Recognizing Jesus. There are times Jesus performs miracles to care for us. There are times when his presence is especially strong. And in those moments, even when we can't see him, we know he is there. Those are wonderful moments. Moments when you pray and you call on the Lord and he is just there. He is so close to you and he's, he's, it's like you could touch him. I, I had one of those this last couple of weeks. I was going through a, 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 a test of some kind. And um, as I was in that, I just focused on his presence and he sat there with me. Just was with me while I'm going through that. It's just lovely when he's like that. But he also ministers to us through his people. He will send someone to help us. In their voice, we will hear his voice. From their hands, we will receive his care. And if we don't understand that fact, we won't recognize him when he arrives. Later on, we'll wonder where he was in our moment of need, even though he was there all the time. He came to us. In those who were willing. Those who had learned to listen. Those who are kind. 
young or old, rough or skilled. That was his gentleness we heard in their voice. His compassion we saw in their eyes. His healing we felt in their touch. I have two daughters that are nurses. And uh, one is a nurse practitioner and the other is an emergency room nurse. And I've thought to myself, because, I, you know, they, they, they just tell some pretty wild stories. And I've thought to myself, what a blessing for someone to have had my daughter in that moment of crisis. And there, there are times in which literally a word of knowledge has saved someone's life. They didn't know that. She didn't go, oh, I have a word of knowledge. <laughs> they didn't know that as she was attending, one of them was attending to the other one in, 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 their, in, their, in their crisis, that my daughter was quietly praying in tongues over them. But she was. God had sent them. God had sent my, do my daughter, either one of them, my wife, by the way, did the same thing. She's a nurse too. Same, same deal. That compassion, that kindness, it was Jesus sitting there. We have to see that when he comes to us, it's not only in the miracle moment of his presence, but it is also in his people. He comes to us in human flesh. He comes to us in, 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 in those who are watching over us. A Stephen ministry we have here. Those are men and women who, who, who have, have trained themselves carefully and will spend an hour or so a week just sitting and listening and giving care to someone. That's Jesus. Jesus in human flesh. Jesus through their hands. Jesus through their eyes. Jesus, he's, he, and, and if we say to him, Lord, where were you? you? You know the joke, don't you? You know, the guy gets stuck on the roof in the middle of the flood. You know, a helicopter comes by and says, take the rope. He says, no, I'm waiting for God. And the next boat comes in and says, get in the boat. He says, no, I'm waiting for God. I forget what the third one is. But after a while, when, God, when the guy talks to the Lord, and he says, Lord, why didn't you save me? He said, well, I sent a helicopter. I sent a boat. And I, and I, and I said, I forget what the He says, that was me. We look right past the person he sent. And say, where are you? He sends us. How many of you, think about it, have had someone, some kind person, some, some place where you were, in a, you, were, you were in a difficult place, and someone came and sat and listened to you, or someone brought their, a healing to you of some form, or a kindness to you, and afterward you thought, why, that was God. Do you know what? It is. He is faithful to us. Let me give you one more example and then I'll quit. This is years ago when our, our middle daughter was born. Uh, we were living on Whidbey Island and um, for, Mary was having uh, some, some, some difficulty with the birth and we had a nurse who clearly did not like Christians and had made all kinds of rude remarks about us at the nursing station, we found out later, and all that kind of thing, and deliberately neglected my wife. And it became quite dangerous at one point because there was, there was some difficulty. And, and I have to... At, at one point, I, I became alarmed enough that, you know, there's a point where you don't care who hears what and you're not, you know, all the, all the cool is gone. I, I just began in the, right in the room and then out in the hallway to speak in tongues, good and loud. <laughs> because I was fighting for my wife and my daughter. And I began to really pray and call on the Lord. It happened to be around 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And I was the pastor of the church, but I wasn't there that day and uh, one of the members of our church was sitting in church 
and all of a sudden felt she was a nurse. She said, I have to go. I have to go down there. And she got up and she said to her husband, I, I've got to go to the hospital. And she came down and just sailed down from, from our church in Oak Harbor down to the Whidbey Island uh, General Hospital and came running in, in the door. I remember seeing her. We were in a hard place, completely neglected. That woman was fired later on, by the way, and not by our complaint. And here she comes in the door, puts her purse down, and goes, I had to come. And she begins to tend to Mary and took care of her, and our daughter, Rebecca, was born. That was Jesus. Do you follow? Yes. That was Jesus who came at our point of need through one of his disciples. He sent her. He strengthened her. He was with her. He came to us through his disciple. And he does that through us as well. If we have eyes to see, we'll see him. If we have ears to hear, we'll hear him. Because one thing is for sure. He will come. Would you say that? He will come. Let's stand. If you'd like, if you can. If you have a bad back or something, please stay seated. Blessed be God. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we see who you are t tonight as we, as we read this passage. Your kindness, your goodness. You are practical. You come to us at our point of need. And you will never forsake us and you will never leave us. I pray right now for every man, every woman in this room and everyone listening. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will have our ears open and our eyes see. But we will see you and we will know that you are there. How many of you right now would say, I'm in a place where I need his practical care. I need him to be with me right now. Would you just raise your hand if that's you. Lord, see us. We, we pray right now. And we say this. You will come you will not forsake us but you will care for us we bless you and we honor you we bless you and we honor you as our great our great deliverer our comfort right now if you're in a place a difficult place just quietly to, to, to him just say Lord I thank you that you're there I thank you that you haven't forsaken me. I thank you that you, you, you are caring for me and watching over me. You promised you would and you are. You have never left me for a second. I bless you for that. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. If you agree with that, would you say amen? amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. He is. He is very with you.